Your mobile phone has a plethora of rich data to train machine learning models on. Think of predictive text on your keyboard, or the wake up word to trigger Siri and Google Assistant, or even the healthcare data tracked by the sensors on your phone. So how do Google and Apple train on such rich but private data while still maintaining your privacy? Through a technique called federated learning. I'm Muckle, a master's student at the University of Cambridge, and in this video, we're going to be diving deep into how federated learning works. This video is structured as follows. First, we'll look at how federated learning works, and then we'll look at the classic federated learning algorithm, FedAverage. We'll then look at improvements to FedAverage and the current state of federated learning research. We'll then look at how you can implement federated learning in practice through frameworks, and federated data sets. We'll end by looking at how federated learning fits into our privacy preserving machine learning toolkits. Let's get started. Normally to train a machine learning model, you host both the model and the data on the same device and we call this centralized machine learning. However, for us, that means Apple and Google upload our private conversations to the cloud to train their machine learning models. Federated learning flips the paradigm. Instead of sending our data to the cloud, we send the models to our devices, and then we train these models locally on our devices. This means the data never leaves our device. Once we've trained our model locally on the device, then rather than sending data to the server, we send the model updates to the server, and the server aggregates the model updates from each of the devices and updates the global model. And then we repeat this process over multiple rounds of training. And in reality, we don't train the model on all the devices at once. Instead, we sample just a fraction of them, of those that are plugged in and idle at night. So you don't actually notice the model being trained on your device. You might be wondering, what makes this setting different to distributed training on GPUs? There are two main factors, communication and heterogeneity. In GPU clusters, all devices are on the same network. So communication is relatively quick. However, in federated learning, devices have to communicate over Wi-Fi. And so this is much slower than the computation and becomes the bottleneck in practice. Heterogeneity comes in two forms, the devices and the data. So first, the devices. Devices vary. Some phones are faster than others. And you might be using sensor data from not just your phone, but your watch, which has much less CPU power. And data also varies. Some devices have much more data than others. Think about how many photos you take on your camera. And unlike traditional distributed training, these data distributions can vary between devices. We say they're non-IID. And this could be because one user decides to take photos of landscapes primarily, while another user decides to take photos of food. The environment also plays a factor. Think of taking photos of wildlife in Australia, where you might see kangaroos, versus in London, where you definitely wouldn't see kangaroos. And finally, in federated learning, as we've touched on before, not all devices will be available to participate. They might run out of battery or drop the Wi-Fi connection and so have to drop out of training. Now, let's move on to the seminal paper in federated learning. This introduces an algorithm, FedAverage, which tries to train a shared model across clients. It does this by trying to minimize an overall global loss that is a weighted average of the individual client's losses. So in this function, there are K clients and each client has its own loss function, FK, which it computes on device. We then weight each of the losses by the size of the client's data sets. So devices with larger data sets will have correspondingly larger weighted losses. Now onto the algorithm itself. We execute this algorithm for a number of rounds of training. First, we sample a fraction C of the K clients. So in this case, we have that K equals six and C equals 0 0.5. We send the current round weights to each client K. So for the teeth round, the weight is denoted by WT. The clients then run stochastic gradient descent on their local data for E epochs. Once they've done that, they send the updated weights back to the server. And once the server has received all the weights, it aggregates them, taking the weighted average. And then we repeat for the next round and so on. Now, FedAverage works well in practice. 
but it isn't perfect. It makes a number of simplifying assumptions. For one, it assumes that all sample devices will complete E epochs of local stochastic gradient descent. But some devices take longer than others. And these stragglers can actually hurt the speed of convergence. So in practice, Fed average just drops the stragglers. But what happens if 90% of your devices are stragglers? And secondly, it's not guaranteed to converge when our data is highly heterogeneous. Fed average weights devices by the proportion of the data that they own. And so it might favor certain devices performances at the expense of others. Therefore, improvements to Fed average have been proposed in the last few years. The first Fed prox allows devices to do variable amounts of work. Now, naively, you might think that this favors devices that can run more steps of gradient descent in the same amount of time and therefore change the weights of their models much more. So Fed prox introduces a regularization term or proximal term that penalizes large changes in weights. This also helps convergence on highly heterogeneous data. As you can think of this proximal term as penalizing the model from changing too much on one single device. And we control the amount that's penalized by this hyperparameter mu. And with heterogeneous data, model performance can vary a lot as different distributions require different sets of features like food versus landscapes. So there are two approaches to fixing this. The first QFED average seeks to make the shared model learnt a lot more fair. That is, it performs similarly on all devices. So rather than weighting devices by the proportion of data that they have, we penalize worse performing devices more, incentivizing the model to improve performance on these devices. And you can see this as we raise the loss to the power of Q plus one. We can tune this hyperparameter Q so the larger Q is, the more these worst performing clients dominate the overall loss. And so the more fair it becomes. Another approach per Fed average seeks to train a model that can be personalized to each device after running a few steps of local gradient descent. And so the loss function now changes from the loss on the current weights at that round to the weights after a step of gradient descent. If you're familiar with meta learning, this uses the mammal approach and formulates federated learning as a multitask problem where each client's distribution is a separate task. As part of my master's degree at the University of Cambridge, I've actually compared per fed average against Q fed average on heterogeneous data. So be sure to hit the like button and comment below if you'd like to see a video on that. Federated learning as a field has seen an explosion in the number of papers submitted to archive year on year, and it can be overwhelming to search through them yourself. I've dropped a link in the description below to a repo that categorizes the papers that have come out in federated learning by topic to make it easier for you. There's also an excellent survey paper that looks at the advances and open problems in federated learning, such as preserving privacy, fairness, robustness, and I'll have that linked in the description below as well. Comment below which federated learning algorithms you'd like to see in future videos. In practice, Google and Apple are the biggest users of federated learning as they have access to millions of Android and iOS devices. Federated learning is typically done at scale with tens of thousands of devices. And the more devices you have, the longer it takes to converge. And it can take tens of days to converge in practice. But what if we wanted to implement federated learning ourselves? Luckily for us, there are a few frameworks that can help us out. For TensorFlow, we have TensorFlow Federated. And for PyTorch, we have PySift, developed by the OpenMind community. Both of these frameworks have vibrant communities backing them that are growing. These frameworks integrate tightly with their respective deep learning frameworks, but they're relatively low level. If you're not using Fed Average, then you're required to implement the federated learning strategy yourself. There's a third federated learning framework spun out of the University of Cambridge called Flower that takes a different approach. Instead of being tied to a particular framework, it's agnostic and you can plug and play different components. For example, within the library, you have an option to swap out Fed Average for a different strategy, such as QFed Average. And although it has a small community, it's growing very rapidly. So it's one to look out for. I've personally been fortunate to use Flower 
in my own experimentations with federated learning. So drop a comment below if you'd like to see a video on how Flower works. Now in terms of data sets, you can use your standard data sets such as MNIST and CIFAR 10 and your own data set and Flower and the other frameworks will provide functions for you to partition them across the devices. There's also a benchmarking library called LEAF, which contains other data sets specifically for federated learning, such as Feminist, a federated extended form of MNIST, and Shakespeare and Reddit data. Federated learning is just one tool in the larger push towards privacy preserving machine learning. And in practice, it's used with a couple of other techniques that are already built into PySift and are available as separate TensorFlow libraries. Firstly, to prevent the model from memorizing any particular client's data, we use differential privacy on the clients. And I've done a video on differential privacy, which I'll have linked in a corner of this video somewhere. Secondly, the individual model updates sent by each client during training could reveal information about that client's private data. So in practice, we use a technique called secure aggregation. This encrypts each individual client's model updates and it's only possible to decrypt this by combining it with tens or hundreds of other client updates. This means the model on the server can't learn updates specific to one client, but rather averaged across clients, preserving individual privacy. I've linked below the Google AI blog post on how they use federated learning with these techniques in practice. If you enjoyed this video, as ever, be sure to give it a like. I make videos around trustworthy machine learning, and I've got a video coming up looking at bias in model data sets. So be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Thank you for watching.